everyone, and welcome to our service at Northwest Bear United Church. It is Sunday, May 28th. Well, actually, I'm filming again on Thursday, and it's surprisingly cold today. Um, so I had to wear something warmer, and this was the only thing that I could find, so I, I just had to throw it on. Uh, anything, anyway, uh, we're all missing lots of stuff during the pandemic, and one of the things that I most miss during uh, this time are officiating at weddings. Most of the weddings that I had last summer and this summer have, uh, of course, been postponed or cancelled uh, until such time as people can gather together in bigger groups. So over the years, I've done weddings in all kinds of places, in, um, in churches, in backyards, at cottages, parks, and I've done a lot of weddings right here. And where I am is in Sunnydale Park, which is the biggest park in Barrie, right in the center of Barrie. And uh, I've done a few weddings right here in this little area. It's a, it's a great place uh, to get married. So as we all know, for those who are watching who are married or in some kind of a partnership, we know that as wonderful as the wedding day is, it's, it's only just, of course, the, the first step and a small part of what being in a relationship is all about. And uh, beyond that, uh, some relationships thrive and, and some relationships go through harder times of, or, they, or they fail. Um, and that's kind of what we want to talk about a little bit today. Really, the topic for my uh, service today, as we look at the Ten Commandments, is talking about trust, because at the, uh, the end of the day, that's at the center of, of any kind of a relationship. Um, and when that trust is broken, uh, how challenging that can be. So as we look at the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, we're really going to talk today about the importance of trust. It's a tough one, um, but we're going to get through it together. So let's head back into the church and, uh, and we'll go from there. See you in a bit. Well, again, good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you are spending some of your Sunday here with us at uh, Northwest Barrie United Church. As always, we like to begin by sharing our uh, celebrations for the day and for the week. Just a couple. First of all, a very happy birthday to Doris Allen, who is turning 87 on June 2nd. And uh, also on June 2nd, my dad, David, is uh, celebrating his birthday as well. So, Dad, uh, happy birthday to you. My only other celebration is I'd like to pass on my congratulations to the Toronto Maple Leafs for winning the first round of the playoffs. Now, to actually be fair, I'm filming this on Thursday and they haven't actually won. I'm kind of just assuming that they're going to win uh, either tonight or Saturday. So if they lost both those games, you are having a very good laugh at my expense right now. And as you can also see, I'm uh, starting a playoff beard, which um, I'm going to keep until the Leafs get knocked out. So hopefully it'll be really big and full uh, within the next few weeks. And I'd like to encourage all the guys that are uh, watching today from the church or outside of the church to, uh, if you're supporting the Leafs, grow a playoff beard uh, as well. We'll all make a statement. And I don't want to um, exclude uh, all our, our women, all the female fans as well that are, are Leaf fans. I know there's a lot of them. So I was trying to think of what could be the alternative to growing a beard. So I googled the, al the alternative to a playoff beard for women. Yeah, I'm not gonna Google that ever again. Uh, so if you could come up with an idea and would love to send it in to me, I'd be very happy to, uh, to share that with the congregation. We'll see if we can get some support going as well. Just a uh, few announcements to pass along. Our uh, headlines on Wednesday morning, our discussion group about current events continues and that's on Wednesday at 10.30. Love to have you join us. Sign up is on Northwest News. Really looking forward to Trivia Night, which is coming up in just a couple of weeks. Friday, oh, just about a week actually. Friday, June the 5th, and that takes place at 7 p.m. And uh, once again, if you'd like to sign up, uh, you can do so through Northwest News. Uh, also in our newsletter, there is the summer challenge that, uh, of, of activities that you can uh, possibly do over the summer and hopefully send us some pictures so we can share it with the congregation. And finally, just a little bit of an update on our church reopening. As you know, if you are from Ontario, uh, Premier Ford uh, unveiled a three-step or three-stage uh, program for, re, uh, for opening the province once again. And it looks like from my reading of that, that it'll be quite a few more weeks before churches are allowed to open to any capacity. So we've decided uh, as a staff and as a board that we're going to keep our church closed through the summer. And uh, hopefully during that time, we'll get a plan in place. And then come September, we're hoping that we can uh, all be well open our doors and, uh, and welcome as many people back 
uh, as we can at that time. So uh, we're getting there. Our final announcement this morning is uh, a final announcement on our stewardship campaign, and uh, this will be done by Daniel and Ashley. Good morning. I'm Daniel Johnston. I'm Ashley Arnold. And we are here on behalf of the stewardship team to say a big thank you to all of you who were able to donate to our Keep the Porch Light On campaign this spring. We raised as of Thursday $7,300 towards our goal of $10,000. So again, a big thank you. With the end of May comes the end of our campaign. But if you would still like to donate, you can use any of the methods listed at the end of the broadcast and include the message porch light. Leave the porch light on was a way of saying that the staff and volunteers at Northwest are doing everything possible to be ready to welcome you back into our unique house of worship. With vaccine numbers climbing and COVID numbers falling, it feels like we are so close to throw the doors open and welcome you back inside. So until that day comes, we'll, we'll keep, keep the porch, porch light, on. light on. I'd like to say thank you to Daniel and Ashley for all their work uh, in organizing this campaign. And thank you to everybody uh, who contributed and, uh, and was a part of it. It's uh, uh, very uh, much appreciated. Let's begin our worship time now with the words of our call to worship. Gather in. Gather in to celebrate the gift of worship. Gather in to the familiar and comforting rhythm of worship. Gather in to hear a story of faith and life. Gather in to the welcome of community that even though scattered is one in heart and spirit. Gather in and may we sense the spirit of God all around us as we share together the gifts of worship. Our opening hymn is called A Love Now Ascending. Uh, you may not recognize the words, but uh, you'll definitely recognize the tune.
please join me now in our opening prayer and let us pray. Loving God, you who create the world and make it turn, we gather in the light of your love. If our souls are like lamps, then perhaps we feel today that our lamps are filled with oil and burning brightly. Perhaps we feel today that our lamps are in need of refilling, the light beginning to dim. Perhaps we feel today that our lamps are empty, and it's all we could do to even open our computers or or turn on our TVs. But no matter how we came to worship today, we are here. And may you provide that healing oil that we find in prayer, in song, in message, and in silence. Fill us with what we need, that our souls may be refreshed, and we can go forth again to shine our lights into the world. Amen. Our special music today is a piece called Prayer for the Road. I hope you enjoy it. I drove through the desert in the cool of the night. Be the big city by morning's first light. Riding till I get what they say I can find. Answers to questions that trouble. Thank you for that beautiful piece of music. As we think again about our virtual offering today, I'd like to take a moment to, expend, to extend again a special thanks to, uh, to everyone's ongoing support of our church through the pandemic. And this morning I'd like to extend an extra special thanks to those who are part of our online church community. Those living in faraway places who have found us on YouTube and are faithfully watching. I know some are former former members at Northwest who have moved away. Some are the family and friends of people who go here, who are watching. And some are just those who stumbled upon us one Sunday and and just kept watching week after week. One of the silver linings of this pandemic has been our ability to reach beyond our walls and connect with so many people far and wide. Every week we have hundreds of viewers to our services, which means that we are developing an online community as well as those who will be returning to this building when we finally open. That's amazing. 
And I know many of you have given your support to our work, and I'd like to say again a very special thank you. We are so pleased that you are part of our wider church here at Northwest. Bible reading today is taken from the Gospel of John. Early in the morning, Jesus came to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now the law of Moses commands us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone who is among you, any, among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard this, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Now go on your way and sin no more. Amen. This morning I'm continuing on with the series of the Ten Commandments called Tuning Up the Ten. And uh, this week we are at commandment number seven, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our light. Amen. There's a Bible out there called the Sinner's Bible, also known as the Wicked Bible. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Published in 1668, it was a reprint of the King James Version of the Bible with one glaring mistake. The word not had been accidentally left out of the seventh commandment, thus rendering it, thou shalt commit adultery. When the Archbishop of Canterbury found out about the mistake, he ordered all copies of the Bible destroyed, and there were many of them, and they were, save for a few. There are said to be at least 14 known editions of the Sinner's Bible still circulating in the world. Most are in libraries or museums, but a few are held by collectors and are said to be worth thousands of dollars. So, I'm going to start this sermon with a big sigh. <sighs> this is a hard one. I prayed all week that I might get laryngitis and would not be able to talk on this topic, but alas, I did not. It's not that it's not an important topic, because it is. But there are a few things that make this difficult. Firstly, I'm British, and we don't talk about these kind of things. We prefer to just avoid them or sweep them under the carpet. And if we do have to talk about them, we tend to blush, so maybe just keep that in mind. But it's more than that. I know what a difficult topic this is for people for a lot of reasons. It's an emotional topic. It's a touchy topic. Anything that gets to the heart of our most intimate relationships brings up all kinds of collateral issues. And we all know the effect that infidelity can have on relationships, marriages, and families. And I know some watching today may know that only too well. And my goal in this series, again, is not to be heavy-handed or make this a guilt trip or open wounds that maybe are just starting to heal so I'm approaching this topic very sensitively, very cautiously, and I hope very gracefully, recognizing that out of the Ten Commandments, this one, for some, may go the deepest. So bear with me, 
because I am going to turn this commandment around in a bit and look at it in a different way. But before I get there, I do really need to talk about it as it is. Because to not talk about it is not to honor the commandment. And actually, some of the history and context of this commandment is kind of interesting. At least I think so. And a lot of it's very disturbing. So let me just share a few things about the seventh commandment. The first thing I want to say about the seventh commandment is that we assume that it's a commandment about morality around marriage and sex. And it certainly is. But it's actually more of a commandment that addresses property rights. It's also a commandment, more than any other, that gives us insight into how women were treated in biblical times. You have to remember that at this time in history, in this part of the world, and in this culture, women were deemed the property of men. And it makes me squirm to say that, but it's absolutely the truth. As it says in the Bible, a woman shall be given by her father to her husband, usually with some kind of financial incentive attached. A horrible idea that unfortunately is still symbolically practiced in weddings today in what we call the giving of the bride. It's a part of a wedding that I would happily leave out. As a result of this, you didn't marry for love as much as you married to secure your property rights. It was just as simple as that. Marriage was a business transaction between men. The women were the commodity that was being traded. So when adultery was committed, it wasn't a crime against love or marriage. It was a property crime. And that's how it was prosecuted. How do we know this? Because it was, a not, it was not illegal for a married man to have a relationship with another woman outside of marriage if that woman wasn't married. It was only illegal if the other woman was married. Why? Because then you were stealing another man's property. And as harsh as that sounds to our modern Western ears, that's the way it went. It was a double standard. And it gets much worse. To be proven that an adulterous relationship had occurred, two witnesses had to have seen the act take place, which you know, to me sounds crazy. But without that, there was only one other way to prove that it happened, and it was this. If a husband suspected his wife of infidelity, and there was no proof in the form of a witness, she could undergo what was called the ordeal of the bitter water. She would be taken before a priest who would force her to drink a bitter concoction which could be made up of whatever the priest wanted to put in it. If the potion did not affect her, in other words, if she did not get sick, she was considered innocent. If she was not innocent, according to this ritual, her stomach would grow, her reproductive organs would burst, and she would become very sick. She would then either die from the poison or she would die from the punishment of having committed adultery. That was barbaric. It was beyond barbaric. But I want to sink, this to sink in for a moment. Because one of my purposes in sharing this series is for us to really think again about how we are using the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, to guide our ethical decisions, or whether we really should be at all. I want you to imagine being a woman back then, a wife. You could burn the dinner one day, and your husband decides he doesn't like your cooking, and he wants to get back at you. He could accuse you of adultery and force you to drink poison. For you as a woman, there was no recourse to stop it. And for him as a man, there was no consequence for having put you through it. And then there was the punishment. For a man caught in the act of adultery with another man's wife or property, there was a punishment which could include death, but rarely didn't. But for a woman caught in adultery, it was very different. It was always death. A woman caught in adultery would be killed by one of three ways. Stoning to death, strangulation, or having fire poured down her throat. It's all in the Bible. The way people treated each other, particularly women, was swift and brutal and utterly barbaric. 
I know this is horrible. But again, that's why we need to be so careful in how we talk about this Old Testament or in how we take it out of its historical context and try to apply it to the modern world. So adultery in Old Testament times was a property crime, and it was treated as such, and it was prosecuted as such. It had little to do with love. So what about today? Does infidelity happen today? Well, of course it does, and we all know that. But the understanding of it is different, and thus the consequences are different. Marriage today, at least in a Western culture, is not a business transaction. It is an act of mutual love and commitment between two equal persons, at least equal under the law, if not in practice. It is two people choosing to go through life together and committing fully to each other. So adultery isn't a property violation anymore. It's a violation of trust and love between a couple. It's a private matter. It's not a legal matter. And as such, there are few, if any, legal consequences as a result especially with no-fault divorce laws. But again, as we know, the very personal consequences can be huge. It's the breaking of a bond of trust, which can be deal-breaking and thus life-changing. And again, for a long time, women bore the brunt of the inequality of this. Particularly for women who, because of inequality in society for so long, were often forced to stay in unhealthy relationships because of a lack of opportunities and thus security for themselves and their children outside of marriage. Thankfully, that is changing. As we move towards greater equity in our Canadian society and women have access to more opportunities in the workplace and can have financial independence, they are choosing to not stay in relationships that are not good or that are not mutually beneficial. The result? Divorce rates are going up. You know, I think this is an interesting bait, debate. I'm not going to have it here, but I'll throw it out so you can have it at home. And it's this. Are increasing divorce rates proof of the breakdown of the family and the crumbling of morals, as some will say? Or are they a reflection of actually a maturing society that is moving closer to gen gender equality, i.e. women or men, don't have to stay in dysfunctional or dangerous relationships because they are trapped with no options outside of marriage. Woohoo! I'll look forward to getting some emails on that one. And I'm not taking sides, I'm just throwing that debate out there. The point is, even though the context may have changed, infidelity is still considered as harmful and hurtful. Whether in ancient biblical times or in modern times, we may have different expectations of it or different consequences for it, but it's still understood as a violation of trust. And unless there's an understanding between a couple as to how they will practice sexuality in their relationship, because some couples choose a model that may be different than what we may choose, unless those expectations have been agreed upon and discussed, the probability of infidelity causing harm, sometimes irreparable harm, is huge. But let me just say this, and then I'll move on to something a little more positive as we tune this one up. I think we should heed Jesus' example in Scripture when he comes across the woman caught in adultery, the story that I just read to you. Because there is so much judgment around this topic. For those in the story with rocks in their hands about to stone her to death, it was very cut and dried. She had broken the rules. She had to pay the consequences. But not so for Jesus. He gets those men, and they would have all been men, to think about times when they felt short, fell short. Times when they let someone down or let themselves down. And there wasn't a single one among them who hadn't made a mistake, and thus they all dropped their rocks and they went home. You don't need me to tell you this because you know it, but let me say it anyway. Relationships are difficult and challenging. There are any number of things that can lead to the breakdown of a relationship. We may see the destination that a couple reaches, but none of us gets to see the journey that led them there. Not a single one of us has a right to sit in judgment over what another couple has gone through. And when a couple is going through a hard time, 
the last thing they need is someone hurling rocks at them. In fact, I can think of a time when we need more support, care, understanding, and compassion from others than when our primary relationship breaks down. Judgment only deepens the guilt and the grief. But compassion lightens the burden. Understanding and support heals the wound. Just something to keep in mind the next time you might be tempted to pick up a rock. Okay, this is all about tuning up to 10. So, what can we do to this commandment to put a new twist on it? Like I said last week, for the final five commandments, which are all thou shalt nots, I want to turn them around and make them thou shalt. So what is the opposite to thou shalt not commit adultery? And no, it's not thou shalt commit adultery, so if that's where you thought this sermon was going, you're going to be disappointed. So what is it? Well, I took a long walk last holiday Monday on that beautiful day to, to think about this because I really wanted to get it right. So I first had to ask myself the question, what actually is infidelity? And why is it so hurtful and harmful? And I think the answer is, at least for me, is because it is a betrayal of trust. I think more than the act itself, it is the fracturing of that bond of trust that makes it so hard for couples to get over it. Trust is like a bank. We put our money in the bank because we know that it will be safe and we, we know that it will be well taken care of. But if we discover one day that the bank has squandered or lost all our money, how quick are you going to be to invest in that bank again? Trust in relationships works exactly the same way. Once compromised, it's difficult for us to have faith in it to protect what is most valuable to us. In this case, our hearts. It's not to say that we can't. We can earn the trust back of others if we truly want that to happen. Just like a bank can earn your money back if it restructured itself and proved that it's worthy of your money. But it's difficult to do. So, if adultery is the betrayal of trust, what is the opposite of thou shalt not commit adultery? I believe it's this. Thou shalt strive to be trustworthy. You know what's great about this? Is I can now apply this to all kinds of relationships and I don't have to worry about blushing anymore. Thou shalt strive to be trustworthy. Do you know trustworthy people? What makes them trustworthy? Well, there's lots of answers to that question, but I, what I did was I took that word trust and I turned it into an acronym. And these are what I believe are the five qualities, at least five of the qualities of being a trustworthy person. I'm going to put each one on the screen as I share them, so here we go. The T in trust stands for be true to your word. Henry David Thoreau wrote that there are three things we need to be true to. Our work, our word, and our friends. Or I always like what Confucius had to say on the topic. He said, be sincere and true to your word, serious and careful in your actions, and you will get along even among barbarians. Hopefully no one is living among barbarians, although I, that may have described some people's homes, home life. Trustworthy people say what they mean, and they mean what they say. If they say they will keep a secret, they will keep a secret. If they say they will get a job done, they will get that job done. You know, working with volunteers, as I do, I know what a treasure it is to find people who are true to their word, even if they don't have the incentive of a paycheck. It's a wonderful quality, and it builds goodwill, and it builds good relationships, and it builds trust. You know, this place that I'm in today wasn't constructed because of the person standing behind the pulpit. It's because of the small army of volunteers over the years who showed up, followed through, and always gave their best, and still do. Trustworthy people are people who are true to their word, and that is so important in a, in a relationship, is being true to our word. How about R? To me, R stands for reliable. A trustworthy person is a reliable person. You can count on them. 
I was an extremely anxious child growing up. I mean capital A anxious. I mean scared of my shadow anxious. When you are an anxious person, especially as a child, but even as an adult, reliability is something that you cling to like a life raft. Thankfully, I was blessed with parents who were always reliable, almost always reliable. When I was in kindergarten, for example, I didn't want to stay in that classroom because I was so scared. Every day, my mom would bend down to where I was, and then she would look up at the clock on the wall, and she would say to me, when that hand is on that number and that hand is on that number, I'll be here to pick you up. And then she would leave. And I would spend all day looking at that clock. It was my lifeline. And sure enough, when those hands were exactly where she said they were, there she would be at the door. And that meant everything to me. As a parent, I've tried to model that same characteristic, particularly when my kids were younger. If they had to be somewhere at a certain time or they had to be picked up somewhere at a certain time, I would move heaven and earth to get there because I know how, meant it much, how much it meant to me as a child. Reliability in a relationship builds trust as well. And that's more than just being in the right place at the right time. It means that the people closest to you can always count on you, rely on you. In a book called Cross Creek, the author Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings shares this cute little dialogue between two young friends. This is what she writes. In the village, my friend Mo once said, me and her as buddies. If her gate falls down, I go and fix it. If, we get it, if I get in a tight spot for money, she helps me if she's got it. And if she ain't got it, she gets it for me. We stick together. You gotta stick to the bridge that carries you across. You gotta stick to the bridge that carries you across. Be reliable. How about you? To me, you in trust stands for understanding. Again, think about the, the Bible story this morning that I, that I read. When that woman is about to be stoned to death in the story, Jesus extends to her forgiveness. But before forgiveness, he extends to her understanding. And not, not only understanding of her, but an understanding of the situation and all those involved. Understanding is a quality that usually precedes forgiveness. Before we can forgive someone, we have to understand them. We have to understand where they're coming from. We have to understand the situation. Trustworthy people take the time to understand what others are going through. They're willing to see things in three dimensions. And what I mean by that is they realize things are more complex than they may appear on the surface. One of the terms I love to use is a backstory. Everyone has a backstory. In other words, everyone has a story that people don't see that is the culmination of where they've come to where they are at that point in time. I have this habit of watching, when I'm watching TV or a movie, is if I see a character that I like, I want to find out their backstory. I want to find out who the actor is that plays them and what that actor's story is. So I'll often get on my phone, and I'll go onto Google, and, uh, and I'll look back at who the actor is and where they came from. And I find knowing that information helps me to enjoy the show even more. I always wondered, what do you think the backstory is of the woman caught in adultery? What led her there? What was her marriage like to her husband? What silent torment could she be suffering from that we know nothing about? Trustworthy people understand that everyone has a backstory. And thus, before rushing to judgment, they take time to dig in to that backstory. And that is so true in a relationship as well. When two people come together in marriage, they don't come as black, at blank slates. They come into that relationship with a backstory. Understanding those stories is vital to building trust in any kind of a relationship. How about S? S stands for steadfast. 
That's a word we don't use a lot in our modern language. What does steadfast mean? It means strong, but it means actually more than that. One author put it this way. Like a rugged tree, be hard and sound at the core. That is being steadfast, being strong in your core. Trustworthy people know themselves. They know what they believe and why they believe it. They stay true to their core beliefs and they exhibit confidence in them. They let themselves be guided by their core beliefs about justice, compassion, dignity, respect. They are people of character. And as a result, people will put their trust in them. In 1983, the U.S. issued a postage stamp commemorating the building of the first steel bridge in America. It was built across the Mississippi River in St. Louis back in the 1800s. Many said it could not be built. And when it was, everyone said it could never support its own weight. People wouldn't go on the bridge because they didn't trust it. So James Eads, who was the builder, ordered 14 locomotives to stop on the bridge at once. Only then did people trust the bridge. When people see that you are strong at your core, they will know they can trust you with the things that are most valuable to them. Be steadfast. And finally, to be trustworthy is to be willing to trust. minister tells a cute little story of trying to wash his little son, who was a toddler, to wash his hair in the bath. He would lather the boy's head up with shampoo, and, and then the little guy would start to cry because he didn't want the shampoo to go in his eyes, and he would naturally look down, and by looking down, that's exactly what happened is the shampoo would come down and go in his eyes. And so his dad would say to him, you've got to look up, keep looking up, and you'll be fine. Look into my eyes, and you'll be okay. There's nothing to fear. It's a simple little image, but it's so true. When we are fearful or worried or we feel guilty or we feel broken, what do we do? We tend to look down. We lose trust in ourselves. We lose trust in others. In the story of the woman caught in adultery, twice it says, Jesus straightened up. And by doing so, he urged the woman to straighten up from looking at the ground. And when she looked up and she looked into the eyes of Jesus, what did she see? She saw someone who forgave her. She saw someone who understood her. She saw someone willing to give her a second chance. She saw someone who wanted her to move forward and embrace her future. She saw Jesus. But most especially, she saw God. Sometimes it's hard to be a trusting person, to trust in each other, particularly if that trust has been broken. That's why our faith invites us to filter our trust through God. I lift my eyes to the hills, says the psalmist. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord. Our faith always invites us to lift our heads. To lean into the strength and the peace of God. And when we do, what happens? We can find the strength to look to the future. We can trust in the promises of forgiveness and grace. We can extend to another a second chance. We can believe that good can come from anything, even from our worst mistakes. What were the final words that Jesus said to the woman? Go. Go from here. In other words, your future awaits you. Don't let this incident define you. Don't let this incident limit you. Don't let it steal your trust in God or yourself or others. But leave the rocks on the ground and go. Because ahead of you could still be the best part of your journey. And the woman left that place and began writing the next chapter of her life. 
thou shalt be trustworthy. True to your word, reliable, understanding, steadfast, and trusting. Phew! We made it to the end, and I don't think I even blushed once. You know, I have a colleague in ministry whom I trust and respect a great deal. And I reached out to her at the beginning of this week to say that I was fretting over this sermon because of the topic. And she said to me, never shy away from talking about the tough stuff. Because we need to hear that stuff too. And she's right. That's where we learn the most. I so appreciated her sharing that with me. And what is true in writing sermons is true in life. Don't shy away from the tough stuff, the tough conversations, the tough decisions, the tough journeys. For that's how we grow and learn and deepen our experience of life. If you are going through a a rough time right now for whatever reason, first of all, be gentle and understanding with yourself. Don't lose faith, but keep your head up and trust in the promises of the one who long ago restored life to the woman whose very life hung in the balance. For in him, we see reflected the God whose love is big enough to draw us in and lift us up, big enough to heal us and to encourage us. Because with God, it's never about throwing rocks. It's always about restoring lives with love. Amen. I invite you out to, again, uh, join me in a prayer, and at the end we will sing together the words of the Lord's Prayer. And let us pray. God, we approach you now in the sacred act of prayer. Heads down and eyes closed, we think of what's in our heart today that we wish to offer in prayer. We bring to mind the faces of those we care about. We think of the challenges and trials of others due to illness or stress or due to a life-changing event that they are facing. We all know someone, maybe a few people, who are in need of the best that we have to offer them. Like Jesus protecting the woman in the story, we are called to put down the stones of judgment and instead to personify the gifts of compassion and love. We pray all those that we care for into the mystery of your love as we continue to care for each other. We offer prayers today for those in relationships. Perhaps today, after listening to the message, we want to give thanks for the relationships that we cherish and for those whose love and support are the solid ground upon which we walk. Perhaps we saw ourselves today in the stories of those who struggle with relationships. Maybe our relationship is going through a difficult time. And so our prayer is for guidance and strength and peace and insight as we move forward to restore or to heal. Also in prayer today, we joyfully give thanks for blessings big and small, for even in this pandemic, the sun shines, the trails beckon, babies are born, love is shared, generosity is displayed. You invite us to lift our heads and look around and give thanks for all that is good in our lives and all that is good in our world. So now we return to you our prayers, to what is in our hearts. And in this silence and sacred moment, we offer those prayers to you.
God who is love, God who is life, in whom is reflected a forgiving and graceful spirit. Bless and keep us this week in all that we do. And as you have blessed us, so may we bless one another through lives of care and gratitude. Hear us now as together we sing the Lord's Prayer. Well, once again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you have a great week ahead. Last week of May, so wait, first week of June. So let's really make it count. I'd like to end today uh, by closing our service with our words of benediction. May you go from this time of worship today filled with hope and inspiration. And if on your journey this week you are tempted to pick up a rock, just pause for a moment and ask yourself, is there a better way? Then open your heart to God's love and grace that invites us all to be instruments of healing and hope. As you are loved, go forth to love one another. Amen. <laughs>